thank you for tuning in. This is Jay Lee's Corner. I am, of course, Jay Lee. And this is my review for Greenleaf Season 2, episode, I think it's episode 11. Um, Changing Seasons. So, this is, well, I think this is like part 2 of Season 2. Because it should really be episode 3. Because the, the season finale was a two-parter. Yeah, I think this should be episode 3. But maybe they doing that, you know, the continuation of a first season. So, whatever. Um, but this is the third episode currently, is what I'm trying to say. So, let's just get on into this particular episode. It was a good episode, I believe. Um, you know, as I say, I, I am a Greenleaf fan. I like the way the stories are told. Um, I bought this shirt, and I'm mad because the dog is all the way over here. And it's kind of aggravating me because it's just weird. So, yeah. But, whatever. Um, so, we do see the uh, episode starts off with... Um, Lady May and Grace are at the table talking about the story. I think we just had some thunder here. I'm, I'm not sure what that was. Um, but, you know, Lady May and Grace were at the table talking about the story that Grace um, did with her boyfriend that has now been published. And, you know, May is saying even though she didn't want, you know, anything else in the public about them as far as story-wise, she also says that she is happy that this what the heck <laughs> this story could you know paint her daughter in a different light and that people will know that you know grace murdered mac in self-defense and it wasn't like murder murder um it was you know self-defense murder which is two different things and um so it's you know her saying you know she's happy that story is out that it would be finally out that it was self-defense and not murder we then see Sophia come in and she's upset because she finds out that she was not nominated or she wasn't inducted into the society to attend a, a cotillion, um, to be a debutante, which Grace did, which, you know, Charity did, and the, also the other sister, Faith. Um, Grace thinks it's because of her story, you know. May is upset. Like, I can't believe that. We've always had somebody in his eye. You know, I'm going to get him. You know, I'm going to get it fixed. I'm going to get it figured out. So, you know, Grace is thinking, you know, it's because of me. You know, the story on the front page is that, you know, I killed, you know, Max. So that's what it is. And she's like, no, you know, the story says it was self-defense. You know, don't worry about it. You know, I'm going to go talk to Jacinda. And she's like, who? And she's like, oh, well, she's the president of the society. So I'm going to go talk to her. So... You know, Grace leaves and goes with her father, you know, the bishop. And May is talking to her maid. She's like, go upstairs and look in this room. And in the bottom drawer, there's a wooden box. Bring me the wooden box. Um, come to find out, she's like, what's, what's in the box? And she was like, a gun. So, so wait, wait, May's like, oh, okay. Um, the next thing we see is we find out that Sophia's cousin, Zora, also did not get accepted for the debutante um, society cotillion thing because she's upset you know how am I going to go to school everyone knowing I didn't get accepted she's oh so upset oh so sad and her mom was like well you know how about we go see the play Hamilton it's like well I thought you said that was too expensive she's like well since we're not buying you a dress we can afford to go to see Hamilton I'm like well damn how much did the damn dress cost I mean you know going to New York is pretty expensive so I mean was you finna buy like a couple thousand dollars I'm like, God damn, I need to start selling cotillion dresses. Um, so, you know, they had that little conversation of it all. Um, so, the next we do see May, and she is seeing the president of the society, and she brought the gun with her. Because the gun was actually an antique collector's item that she figured the lady would like, because I guess she's a collector of art and different old things and stuff like that. So, you know, as she's like, you know, I just want you to have it. You know, it was an old gun in the house. We found it when we moved there, you know, or whatever, whatever. You know, May always up to something. So, she then says, oh my goodness, look at this. She then finds an old yearbook, so to speak, which is the year that, I think, Charity was a debutante in the cotillion. It's like, oh, look at my baby. So, the president, Jacinda, I think her, her name is pronounced Jacinda, is saying, yeah, we're so sorry that you didn't nominate anyone this year, but we completely understand so, May is like, what are you talking about? I nominated both my granddaughters. And she was like, oh, well, we never got their nominations. But we understand, you know, what all you had going on. She was like, no, I, I emailed them in myself. And she was like, well, when we got the package, your granddaughter's names weren't in there. 
and she's like, well, you know, how could that be? I not not I nominated them both. And she's like, we well, yeah, had the paperwork just didn't have them on there. Well, who did the paperwork? And she's like, oh, you know, the board secretary. It's like, well, who was the board secretary this year? She was like, oh, Tasha Shanks, Pastor Shanks' wife, who also hates them. Uh, that's the light-skinned pastor who says that Bishop killed his father from before. So, yeah. Um, next we see Bishop and Grace, and they're at Triumph Church. Uh, Jacob is also there, mainly because, you know, Triumph is Pastor Shanks, Pastor Shanks, church who they don't get along with all too well and it's because the monthly meeting of the council of churches is being held at triumph this month they rotate is you know bishop shanks turn to host and that's where it is so pastor shanks come in and of course he late he comes strolling in with another pastor and you know he walks right past grace and bishop and he goes to jacob like hey bishop i mean you know hey pastor um Greenleaf, hey, da, 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 da. and he's like, you know, good to see you, brother, good to see you. And he walks off, and he looks straight at Grace and Bishop, and he does not acknowledge them because he's just rude. You know, that's what he do. Um, so you know, we see that part of that. Um, Jacob then speaks at this particular meeting, and he's just saying how, um, you know, how he and Triumph Church has parted ways, that he started his own church, and that. Um, he's on his own path. So they show the beginning of his conversation with his speaking engagement is what I'll say. The next thing that we see is, you know, Lady May checking Tasha. And she's like, you know, why was my granddaughter stepped off the nomination? You know, why would you do that? And Tasha is basically denying it all, saying she did not intentionally leave off Sophia or Zora. She's like, I don't know how this could have happened, how this was an insight, you know, but I don't know. And May, like, look, I personally mailed, emailed in the, the nominations myself, and, you know, I sent it. So Tasha still said, you might have did that, but I didn't receive them, you know what I'm saying? I didn't receive these phantom emails. I'm like, go ahead, Tasha, throw that shade, call them down on emails, phantom, because you ain't never get them and you didn't receive them, as she say. Um, you know, and Lady May, May is still saying how... She's upset. She can't believe that, you know, Tasha would go as far as to purposely leave her granddaughters off, you know, just because of her husband's vendetta against their family. And Tasha gives up and says, you know, I'm disappointed in you that you would even come here accusing me of doing things. And May's like, look, you, you lying, you know, my granddaughters don't deserve this, you know, your husband's coming from my whole family, you know, he's been trying to get at my husband, my children, and everything. And Tasha's like, but he has every right to have them bones to pick with y'all. You know what I'm saying? He has every right to do that. Because, again, as he says, Pastor Greenleaf killed his father in a fire in a church a long time ago. Um, and she's like, but, again, my husband don't have nothing to do with this. I didn't do anything. And <laughs> May like, so you just going to lie in my face like that? You know, you, don't you have any self-respect? Tasha then gets up from her desk and she's like, I sure do have self-respect. So you know what? You can leave. Have a good day. And she goes back to her office and then we go back to her desk. So May is looking and she's like, where you get that pain from? And she's like, well, yeah, I saw you in a, in a magazine and you had that particular artist paintings on your wall. So I felt like any other woman of substance should have that kind of art on her wall. So I got one. And... So she's kind of trying, I think, she, I feel like she was trying to appeal to her womanly side or, you know, we both women in this situation, but May wasn't having it. May was like, you know, I'm going to find those emails. And when I do, you're going to be like a butterfly pinned to the walls of justice with no escape. I said, okay, May, thread that girl with the whole, it, that was a straight up Christianly <laughs> um, way to check someone and say, I'm going to have you up against the wall and you're going to be getting cracked with no Vaseline. That's what I took it as. So, when Lady May leave, Tasha do sit down and she almost looked guilty. Like, she know she caught it was a weird look that she, you know, had her, I'm sorry, my eyes itching as always. Um, a weird look that she had on her face or mo maybe that she was just in shock over the whole way that Lady May came in and checked her. So, you know, from there we do see the scene where the cops is all talking 
um, there is another pastor talking about a like a 16 year old boy who tried to kill himself because as the boy said that he thought God did not love him because he was gay and you know it's hard to discuss homosexuality because you never know how somebody feel about it they can feel one way or the other um, this particular stance that they're taking, you know, they're upset that this kid tried to kill himself because he thought God didn't love him because he was gay. And, you know, Grace asked, you know, how is he doing? And he's like, well, you know, he's kind of brain dead right now. So we're, you know, just asking for prayers, you know, to make him get better. Pastor Sh uh, Shanks get on the mic, well, on the mic. He gets, he gets up there and he's just saying how... You know, that's crazy. No kids should try to kill themselves. And how, even though they all might feel differently on the topic of the conversation of homosexuality, they all should still be on the same side as far as how they know God loves all. Basically because the boy was saying he felt God did not love him because he was gay. And so Skanks was saying, we should be advocating the fact that God loves everyone. You know, um, and how they need to do something. So... That's that whole scene. So the next scene is Grace talking with Jake, Jacob and Bishop. It's like, you know, how did y'all feel about what he said? So Jacob was like, you know, well, I'll offer my prayers. And Bishop is basically saying how he doesn't think the Council of Churches should take such a loud stance on homosexuality. Um, just because he's like, you know, some people thrive on controversy. And everybody know if churches would start to stand up for gay people that might be controversial for different reasons just because you never know again what side of the fence some people are on um so it's like because the bible teaches against homosexuality but it also preaches love so you it's it's a hard in between you know i'm a person where i feel like if a person is gay that has no merits or that doesn't mean God does not love them or that I can't be their friend or I can't love them or whatever. Even if I don't agree with them being gay, I can accept them being gay because that's their life to live. You know, because God loves all. So, you know, Grace is just like, you know, you know, Pastor uh, 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 Skank does walk up. He thanks Grace for asking how the boy was and, you know, saying how hopefully they can do something to further the cause or help the child and everything. So Grace is like, you know, hopefully there's something that we can do. So the next thing that we see, um, Carlton, who was the gay choir director, who Lady May made them fire. Okay? She made them fire him. Um, basically because he was gay. We're going to be honest and say that's what it was about. And, you know, he's there to see Charity. In the earlier scene, Charity called him, but I didn't talk about that because it was so little. Um, and, you know, She's like, you know, I'm happy you came. I almost thought you wouldn't because you didn't sound too happy to hear from me when I called you. And he's like, well, yeah, I was happy you called, but, you know, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, he tells her that he's disappointed in how she handled him being fired. Meaning, after he was fired, she didn't reach out to him. They kind of lost touch and they weren't, you know, um, communicating anymore. And that, of course, made him upset and he was disappointed in her. She's like, you know, I'm so sorry. There's just so much going on. Um, you know, I just got busy. And he's like, oh, you was, you got too busy for your own friends, and you were too busy to talk to me then, but when you needed me, you can call me. And she's like, no, 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 no. You know, just things happen. And she's, he's like, well, what happened? And she's like, I got divorced. And then he's like, oh, you know, oh, so you guys finally split. You know, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he's like, but that's when you lean on your friends, you know, in times of, uh, that's when you lean on your friends in time of need. And she's like, well, there's, you know, I couldn't, at that time, there was so much that I couldn't tell you, so I just didn't say anything. And he's like, what do you mean? What could have happened that you couldn't tell me? And then, of course, he says that, and of course, it switches scenes. Um, the scene switches from Jacob, Bishop, and Grace leaving the, the church. And Bishop is talking to Jacob, saying, you know, I liked what you said up there. You know, it was really good. And he's like, you know, thanks, Pop. And then Bishop also says, you know, the name of your church, uh, the real church. And he was like, yeah, you know, God put that on my heart to name it that. And he was like, you know, I really believe he did. You know, good job. He also then invites Jacob and Jacob's wife over for dinner. 
which is a good thing because they had been in odds ever since Jacob left Calvary. So um, it was a way that Bishop was seeing Jacob in a different light and seeing that he has his own calling with God. And Bishop is finally seeing that is what it is. So I think that's a very, very good thing. And Grace is seeing this interaction and just seeing how they are, you know, just having a, a friendly conversation, you know, between father and son. They like shake hands and they leave. So, yeah. Um, the next thing that we see is May at her office and she's having their assistant look for them emails. And she's like, you know, I need to email that was sent like back in December. And the girl like, well, I can probably find it, but you have so many open windows. She's like, you got windows open from two years ago, so I need to close some of them down. She's like, well, no, I don't, I don't want to lose anything. And for me, that was funny because, you know, older people who are on technology, they don't know how to work it all the way. So it's like, of course, May, because she's el older, um, she probably has all these windows open, thinking that she closes them, they will, she can't find them again. But, you know, <laughs> that was funny. Um, but the assistant does end up finding the email from two years ago, so she prints them off. And, of course, May is like, got your ass. Um, next, we see the bishop in his office. And he's eating a pineapple, a pineapple up that down cake. And Rochelle made it for him. Yep. Mm -hmm. Little young thing, Michelle. Michelle. Rochelle made him some pie. Like, I knew you was a pineapple upside down cake, man. How you know what kind of man he is and y'all only met once? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We ain't gonna talk about that. Um, so, Rochelle then says, you know, the secret to the pie is having young pineapples. You know, young pineapples are very good. Because old pineapples get watery and sour. I said, did she just say that all we... Really? We... Mm -hmm. So May walks in and Bishop says, you know, hey May, you know, hey babe, this is Rochelle. Rochelle, this is my, the love of my life. You know, Lady May. She's like, oh, hey, you know, hi, blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, taste this cake. It's so good to make, it'll make you want to slap your mama. Rochelle made it. And May Nancy goes, did you not? Because Lady May ain't no fool. Don't no woman, young woman, make another man who's married a pie and bring it to him in his office, not around his wife. I mean, that's just not what you do. Okay? You knew Rochelle. That ain't what people do. And Lady May know that shit ain't right. And so, you know, <laughs> Bishop, like, you know, you can taste it. And she's like, no, I'm okay. I'm straight. Um, because Lady May was looking at her like, you old young alpha. That's how she was looking when Bishop said she made me this pie. When it made, when it made me this cake. So, you know, Bishop then mentions what well, asked Lady May, hey, did you find anything about, you know, Sophia and Zora not getting into it? Did you talk to Jacinda? And then Rochelle's like, oh, Jacinda, I know her. If there's any way I can help, just let me know. And Lady May was like, no, you great did enough. Bye. And she walked away. And there was an awkward moment, absolutely positively. And she's like, did I do something wrong? And he was like, no, you, you didn't do anything. You were perfect. Bishop, don't do it. Don't do it, Bishop. Just, I'm just going to say, don't do it. Leave it alone. So, the next thing we see is, you know, Grace goes to see Pastor, Pastor uh, uh, Skanks. And they're talking about what they want to do regarding the boy who tried to kill himself. And I feel like Grace was trying to feel Skanks out to see what kind of person he really is because she hasn't had much interaction with him. Her interaction has basically been through word of mouth from her parents or her brother, or her dad or her brother. And, you know, he's like, he doesn't know what to do. And he's like, I figured you came here to me to tell me you had a plan. And she was like, no. Hmm, nope, I don't. So, she, I think she was, again, she was just looking at him to see what angle he was coming from with the story, to see how really committed he was, and just what he planned to do. He goes on to tell a story about how he was, you know, always a little person, or a little person, and how when he was younger, they called him Little Man. Um, but he had a big mouth. He's like, I had a big mouth. I could always talk my way out of anything. And, you know, as I got older and older, older and older and older, my mouth got bigger. And I, at times, needed to use my big mouth to make bigger, to make big friends. To help me when I got, my big mouth got me in trouble. And he's like, you know, eventually I realized, you know, his big mouth had got him in so much trouble that he needed the biggest of the friends. And he's like, finally he found the biggest friend. God. Yes, he did. And, you know, he goes on just to 
to preach about how God is important to him and that's who he, who he is as a person. He does ask Grace who she is as a person. We see her like the uh, ending conversation that she's having, but not what she really says. You know what I'm saying? So that part, I was like, okay, I, you know, I kind of didn't understand why we didn't hear her talk about who she was, how he talked about who he was. We should figure that out later. Um, so later we see Zora is being stupid and she with that boy, uh, Isaiah. And they in her room, all uh, kissing and hugging on her bed. I'm like, Zora, what is wrong with you, girl? What, what, what is wrong with you? But they always say, preach your kids, be the freak ones, you know? Preach your kids, preach your grandkids. You know, I am the grandchild of a preacher. But I was an angel, so I don't know what that like, where that came from. So, you know, he basically trying to give her, get her to give up her cookie. And, you know, saying how, you know, we talked about it. We, we agreed to it. And she's like, well, no, we did. You know, we talked about it, but that was really it. And he's like, come on, don't you know I care for you and I'll take care of you. I wouldn't do anything to hurt you because she said, you know, I'm scared. I got you, girl. Just feed her all kind of lies. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so he basically does. She's like, well, no, do you have? He's like, of course I have. I have everything we need. I guess when he had condoms. Um, so the part that I found appropriately inappro inappropriate <laughs> was when, as he was convincing her to have sex because they did have sex. They didn't show them have sex. They just show her say, okay. And they laid down and was kissing or whatever in the bed. The song that was playing was Childish, Gam Childish Gambino's Red Bone. You know, he's like, stay low. You know, that song. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get yeah, but the stay woke. I I called the song Stay Woke. I didn't even know it's called Red Bone. But yeah, because my thing was you are in bed with this boy who is convincing you to do something that you should not be doing. Stay woke, mama. You know, stay woke, stay woke, girl. Wake your ass up. Because you really just let him bamboozle you and hook with you into losing your virginity. Because I'm assuming she was a virgin before. Um Okay, again, I'm assuming, and I'm we know I'm gonna say she was a virgin before because she was in how she was scared. If she wasn't a virgin, she wouldn't be scared to have sex. Um, so yeah, he convinced her to have sex, which is so dumb because you know, this dumb. I just you know, it's just dumb. So you know, the next thing we see is Carlton and Charity, and they're still talking, and she has now told him everything about Kevin being gay. Um, and just, you know, all, everything that, and now he's up to, he's abreast of everything that happened. And she's like, you know, the, the crazy part about it is, you know, with everything that happened, you know, me and him getting divorced, you know, having to deal with the divorce and getting divorced and cussing and all this other stuff. We never dealt with the fact, we never, we, we were, we, uh, hold on, sorry, we were never able to grieve, um, the daughter that passed away. So I know people have said before, like, didn't she have twins? And was she pregnant with twins? And why is it just one baby and no one said anything? She addresses that. I'm like, okay, go ahead. So she, you know, admits how no one talks about the daughter she lost um, while she was pregnant. That so is the thing of one twin died inside of her, which is why she only has one child now. But she was like, no one talks about her. No one, you know, everyone just kind of avoids the whole conversation. Um, as if it's rude to talk about it. And she's like, so she just has this overwhelming grief at times because she hasn't grieved her daughter. She lost a child. And she was like, but they were just so busy busy doing everything else, they didn't have a chance to grieve for that. And so she was just breaking down about how hard it is, you know, to not say her name or to not talk about her and how she feels like if she, she, she feels like she doesn't want to let go of her daughter because it would be too painful. So Carlton, you know, says her name. She's like, oh my God, you remember her name? You know, no one said her name since, you know, since before she passed away. And she's, of course, she's very, very emotional. And I, I, I really felt like this is such a great scene. Not only because it lets the viewers know what happened to the other baby, but also what she's been dealing with privately. You know what I'm saying? Like, she's been going through that alone and no one is aware. You know, so Carlton says to her, you know... I'm here to help you carry that burden. You know, you don't have to worry about carrying no more. Put it on me, and I'm going to carry it for right now. I'm like, go ahead, friend. Be, yes, okay? Be there for your girl. Ask the freaking Lulu. Yes, won't he do it? Okay? Oh my. Come through, friend. That's what a friend does. A friend comes through and says, you know what? You having a hard time. You can't handle this, handle this emotion or this, this situation. Put it on me. 
You know what I'm saying? Give yourself some time to breathe and get over that uh that loss or love or whatever it is that you're feeling. You know, give me that grief that you're feeling and you know what I'm saying, going about your business for some time and let loose. You know what I'm saying? I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, speak to me, Lord. Sorry. Got you know, carried away a little bit. So okay, I'm back on track. Um <laughs> So the next thing that we see is uh Lady May and she just took these emails to Tasha and she's like you know, here you go. I told you I sent it. And Tasha, like, oh my God, you know, I don't know what's going on. I never received this email. You know, it's just so, I don't know. And so May was like, well, you know, essentially, when you see the, the, that I sent it before the deadline, you should go ahead and fix it and put my, my granddaughter's in. And Tasha, like, hold up, wait. Oh, I see what happened. You sent it to the wrong email address. And she's like, what? And she's like, take a look for yourself. It's supposed to be dot org, not dot com. I'm like, God damn it, May. You said this is the wrong dot. Oh, Lord Jesus. But you know, mistakes happen. So, um, May is like, but you still see that I sent it before. You know, even if I made an error, I still sent it before. So, y'all should just let them in. And she was like, well, you know, I don't know if you can do that. Same like, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'm going to go talk to Jacinda. And Tasha, like, well, she's already pissed off with you anyway because I told her how you came up here and was talking to me like you was the old Zaditi white woman. I said, did she just call her old Zaditi white woman? I mean, is she, uh, really? Is she like a white woman in America? I am a white woman in America. I lie, white chicks. Um, but, you know, she kind of, in her own way, she put me in her place. But at the same time, she didn't because... I don't think they was acting like a old, like a white woman. She was just acting like a person who is used to getting. Well, that is like a white woman. I'm sorry, caught myself. I said it. Um, so she then says to me, "You know, you will never." She she was saying about how she can't wait to be in this whatever magazine, and she's like, "But as far as you, you know, you will never be in that magazine again." And it's the same magazine that she's seen May in before that had the portraits up. So she was saying like, I'm going to be in that, I might not be in that magazine now, but I will be in that magazine someday and your ass won't ever be in it again. Okay, Tasha. I don't like your ass, but okay. So the next thing we see is May walk into Bishop's office and say, I need you to invite Rochelle over to dinner. And he was like, well, why? And she was like, I need her help. And she just walked away. Okay, come through. So at dinner, you know, May apologize for how she acted the first time she met Rochelle with the whole pie situation. Um, and Rochelle's like, okay, it's okay, it's not a big deal. And, you know, I don't think about it. So, they then get into the conversation of, you know, Rochelle sent how she left her last church because she had breast cancer and she did not feel supported by the pastor. Um, so she left. You know, she was sent how she tried other churches in between that time and none of the bishops moved her. She then says, but Pastor Skanks was the closest one who moved me um, but Bishop moved me, so that's why I moved to Calvary. So, May, like, yeah, you know, Bishop showed, you know, he does have the, you know, he, he does move people. So, I'm like, okay, Lady May, you get her what she putting down. Um, you know, Grace brings up how, you no, know, then when she, they were like, Skanks, really, how does he move people? How does he move you? And Bishop jokes and say, you know, we were at the thing early, and I think that Grace got a little bit influenced by him. And they're like, well, how? What? Grace, what? You know, Grace says, look, I just feel like he had um, compelling points about trying to help this boy who tried to commit suicide. And May is saying how, you know, Skank is basically a shameless hypocrite. And what is um, uh, Carissa, who was Jacob's wife, agrees with her. And Jacob's like, Carissa, because she was saying that because of the whole gambling thing and all his being with the people, well, yeah, his demons that people don't know about. So, yeah, he is, you know, a shameless hypocrite. But they don't know that. So, Jake was like, you know, don't go too far. Don't say too much. Um, you know, May then says, you know, Calvary does not, you know, discriminate against homosexuals. Grace laughs. And she's like, whatever. And then May's like, well, we don't. And then Carissa brings up how Kevin left. And she's like, no one asked Kevin to leave. He left on his own. You know, any demons that he heard that he's facing is his own personal demon. You know, that's on him. Um, Grace and Carissa is basically going back and forth. You know, just about people being gay, if you should accept it, about them being there. It was a back and forth conversation where, you know, they don't get along anyway. 
and Grace was saying how we need to still love them. And Carissa was saying how, you know, people try to conflict the fact that God loves all, but God also preached against um, homosexuality. So they were kind of going back and forth on that whole thing. And then Carissa brings up, she's like, you know, yeah, Grace, you know, your needs are always, you know, fight your need for justice is the reason that Sophia and Zora were left out. And she's like, what are you talking about? She was like, you know, the debut talk, the, the concilian stuff. And May didn't say nothing because we know it's really May for it because May sent the damn email to the wrong thing. But May didn't say anything at that particular point. So, um, what do we see next? Some little. Zora tells Sophia that she lost her virginity to Isaiah. Sophia does not like Isaiah because she's a smart girl. And, but when Zora tells her, you know, we did it. We did it. And Sophia's like, you had sex? And she says it really, really loud. She's like, shh, you know, be quiet. Um, she then asks her, you know, well, how was it? She was like, it was weird. You know, I, good, I think. But it was weird. And it's weird because she had sex and she doesn't even know if she enjoyed it. You know, she doesn't know. And when someone says it was weird, my thing was, was it weird because of something that he did? You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm like, or was it weird because she did something that she really didn't want to do? So for her, it wasn't enjoyable. You know, some people lose their virginity and it's enjoyable. Some don't and then it's weird. And the reason it's weird is because you probably should not have lost your virginity at that particular moment. So... Um, the next thing we see within them is Sophia, you know, video chats her boyfriend. And she basically asks him if he has had sex. And he's like, what? You mean, you know, no? Have you? And she's like, no. So we get there both first, just thank God. Um, and he's like, well, you know, why are you asking that? She's like, well, you know, I'm just wondering. Um, and that was the end of that particular thing. But I think it's good that it kind of shows what happens sometimes when you have two kids who are friends or cousins and they're around the same age and one is experiencing things is experiencing things that the other one is not. And I feel like eventually Sophia is going to be the saving grace of Zora cuz Zora man, she just out here just doing things. Um so the next thing that we see is May and Rochelle are having a little bit of a conversation. Rochelle is about to leave the house. You know, May apologizes again for being rude earlier. It's like when I was just going through some things, you know, and that was kind of crazy. She said, but that brings me to something else. You know, you mentioned how you knew Jacinda, the president of the society. She's like, yeah, she's one of my clients, you know, who I consider a friend. And she was like, I was just wondering, you know, after everything I've been going through, I had what my mom would call an overlooked and they don't show the conversation, but we know that Lady May is asking her for her help in getting the girls into. And next, the next scene is we see that May and Grace are at the table, like the following day. And May finally says to Grace, you know, you know, Grace, it wasn't your fault. And she's like, what are you talking about? And she was like, you know, it wasn't your fault. It was my fault. I sent the email for their nominations to the wrong email address. So it was me who made them miss it. Um, and she's like, you know, I'm so sorry, but I'm trying to make up for it. You know, Jacinda, I mean, uh, Rochelle knows Jacinda. So I'm trying to see if she can help us get some things done or, or get them both in. So Sophia then comes in like, you know, mom, we got in. You know, they just, just sent an a email to me and Zora and said there was some kind of, you know, big mix up. But that we're both, you know going to be debutantes and will be in the cotillion. So, of course, they're so happy, so happy, so happy. So, Sophia leaves. And, you know, Grace says to her mom, you know, Mama, thank you for telling me. Because, you know, May didn't have to tell Grace that it was her fault. May could have let Grace kept thinking that because of her story, that's what it was. But she didn't do that. And, you know, Lady May responds back saying, you know, thank you for not judging me. Their relationship is very much so getting better. Um, it's sad that it's well no their relationship is getting better based on Mac being killed so it's like you know it's sad that it took a murder for it to happen but you know that's life sometimes and you know before Grace walks out she says you know I know Rochelle helped us but 
and may cut her off. She was like, I know. We'll fight that fight when it, when it comes to it. Because they both know Rochelle is after something. They don't know what yet. And they know she trouble. And it's a good thing that they're on the same accord. So that's our enemy. That's who we have to go after. So, you know, Grace does leave. And, you know, Lady May calls the maid again. And she's like, I need you to take, you know, the painting down and put it in storage. She's like, matter of fact, everyone from that artist, take them all down, send them back to the gallery. It's time for a change. And it sure is because she like that old heifer down at the goddamn old society trying to check me about my paintings and where I am. And if I'm going to be in the magazine again, act like my time has passed. No siree, I'm going to get your ass together is what she was saying. So the last thing of the evening is we see Charity sing a song for that man she like. That producer man that she does like. And, you know, it's a nice song and she's singing it and everything. But as she's singing it, you know, the guy sits down. And I'm like, why are you sitting so close, sir? Why are you sitting right? I mean, you like right up. To, I mean, you, you couldn't just like ask her to scoot over or stand behind her or just something. So she's like, you know, how do you like the song? He's like, I think it's really good. I think it's a hit. And then Charity just kisses him. Well, okay, Charity. I mean, you divorced. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And maybe because you kind of have the burden lifted off of you about the death of your daughter, you're, you were able, able to talk about it. It's making you be more open to moving on with your life. But she kissed that man, y'all. In his mouth. And that's how the episode went off. So that was my review of Greenleaf Season 2. I'm going to call this Episode 3. Because Episodes 2, 1 and 2 were last week. I'm going to say episode, episode 3. So that was my review. I am Jay Lee. This is Jaylee's Corner. Until next time, people. Peace.